I'm not sure how many of you remember those um, jokes from some times ago, where we asked, how many scientists, for example, does it take to change a light bulb? But now working in the field of radiomics, I'm feeling constantly reminded for those jokes, because the first thing we usually ask is the question, how many data sets do we really need for this or that radiomics study? So that's something that's really special to this data, uh, to this community, the radiomics community, and the question how we could really uh, try to classify clinical outcomes based on medical imaging. And the main reason for this are actually um, the confounding effects. So we wanted to really investigate if this, nece if this is necessary to uh, control for this confounding effects really in the way we do it. Most of the things I'm going to present in this talk today are from a recent study that we published in Scientific Reports. So you're welcome to read the details here. Be going, before going into the detail too much, um, let me thank the co-authors uh, and the members of my lab for their participation in this work. Um, it wouldn't have been possible without their help. Um, so the first thing is, why do we need more than one data set to build a classification for medical imaging? So the main reason here are the confounding effects or effects that might affect your classification system, but not the target that you want. A typical example would be the manufacturer of your imaging device. So we know that a classification system might behave different if it's um, looking on images from a Siemens scanner than it does when it's looking from an image of a Philips scanner. But we also are pretty sure that it doesn't affect the patient survival, for example. Um, so you want to be sure that your classification system is robust, robust against these confounding effects. But a problem that we are facing is that most of the studies we are looking on are very limited with, uh, in terms of confounding effects. And this is mainly because we are often using retrospective data and there's sometimes even ethical reasons or financial reasons that we don't I, that we are not able to include the information from the sites uh, from about the confounding effects. This problem is often solved by using site studies, so additional and small studies that are actually looking into these effects and trying to quantify them somehow. But you can imagine that it's quite expensive and time consuming to do those studies. So an important question is, is it really necessary to do this? If you're looking in literature, we're seeing a mixed picture here. So there are some, uh, so if you're looking on the huge amount of, uh, on the big quality insurance initiatives, we see that they strongly recommend to care about the confounding uh, effects. Also, if you're looking on the most well-known studies, they also include side studies. But then if you're looking on the huge amount of studies that have been published in the last year, we see that the most of that most of them actually are not using any confounding stu uh, side studies or control for confounding effects. So the question at hand is, do we really need to consider them? And we tried to answer this question in the study and we focused on two research questions. The first is, do we need to control for the confounding effects? Is it necessary or is there only a small benefit if we're doing it? And we should focus on more uh, faster and more more research on this area. And the second question is, it's currently done by a process called feature filtering where we remove features. And is this assuming that we actually need to control for confounding effects, the best way to, to actually work with our confounding data? To look into this question, we choose a experimental setup that consisted of three different data groups. Uh, so actually we took one data set and split it into two three groups simulating a uh, normal radiomic study using group one, where we estimated the confounding effect as we would do in a radiomic study, and group two, which simulated our main study. So we used it to train and estimate the performance of a classification system for clinical outcome. And then, and that's unique to our study and differs from a normal radiomic study, we had a third group that also included data from with different confounding variables, values for the confounding variable. And that could then be used to actually assess how good a classifier we found in group two is actually 
if you have this confounding pro uh, variable with a different volume. We use two different data sets in our study. So first we used the simulated data set, which allowed us to very closely control the data and to see the interactions and better understand if the process really works and where all these shortcomings are. And then we use the public available uh, data set that's very huge and uh, uncommon for clinical data, the leading hydrate data set. Uh, that also has the benefit that it comes with seven different clinical outcomes that you could predict. And a lot of meta information that allowed us to estimate three confounding effects, namely on um, the annotator, so who made the annotations, the manufacturer of the imaging device, and the voxel size. Use these, with these data, we try to estimate two metrics because we reason that it's not simply one metric um, that allows us to really capture the problem in detail. So we were interested in two questions, actually. The first is, how good is the system if you have a data set that has a different value for the confounding effect? And that's represented by the AOC score that's obtained on the test data set. And then we are interested on the second question, how much difference is there between the real performance of the system, so the performance that you would see in the clinical routine, and the performance that you would have been published in your paper. And that's the prediction error, actually. And of course, you want to have this prediction error very small. The first thing that we saw on our data um, is that, yes, there is a prediction error. We saw that the performance drops if we are using feature filtering, and that's depending actually on the data set. So I'm showing you here the data from the simulated data set. It's really dependent. We saw it sometimes that a feature filtering approach was better. But what we basically always saw, both in the simulated and the real life data set, is that um, not controlling for the confounding variables, leading to a highly overestimated performance. For the given and shown example, it means that we basically estimated and performance nearly 95% uh, if we not account for the um, confounding variables, and you can clearly see that it makes a difference if you have a system of 95% or 70% performance. And that's already showing the importance of controlling for confounding variables. Seeing these results, we wondered if we can further improve the process, especially if we're looking on the methods that are currently used. And that led us to the third research question. Because the current methods in this field that are used by most studies are based on a filtering approach. So you use the information from the site study, identify a parts or features of your classification system that are mostly affected by the confounding variable, and you then remove those information actually from the main study. You are then able to build a classifier or train a classifier using only information that it's not affected by the confounding variable or less affected by the confounding variable, but you have less information available during this step. And you wanted to answer the question if it's possible to improve this process by not throwing away information, but rather fusing the information we have from the two different data sets and by enriching the complete data set. We use data augmentation for this approach um, so it's called data augmentation for information transfer, David. Um, and we tried to come up with a very intuitive approach to actually uh, show that we fuse the information. Using this approach, we were then in fact able to show that it improves the performance as we expected. Because the classifier has more information during the training, it's, all, uh, it's also possible to build more and stronger classification system that showed a better performance. Not only like here shown in the simulated data, but this is an effect that we saw constantly over different uh, data sets and different combination of targets. And more importantly, for me at least, we saw also that a uh, prediction performance, so the accuracy which we, um, for which we were able to predict how good our system works on the whole system, uh, on if you have different values for confounding variables, is dropped. So we are now better to make better prediction. And this not only like here in the simulated data, but we saw it also like here in the real life data. 
You can see, cl see clearly that we outperformed all the other approaches on building a classifier, even if you're not controlling for any confounding variables. And not only in the performance, but also in the prediction error, which is significantly lower than um, the prediction error that would be made if you're not controlling for the feature filtering approach. And we, of course, tested this for the different combinations that we had, and we controlled um, for different reasons. Seeing the results here for random first, we were uh, curious if it's really our method of it, if it's just an artifact of the methods that we used, so the feature selection methods and the classification. So we tested different combinations. We tested, like shown here, um, different classification system. So these are the mean results for all 21 combinations on the real life data set. And you can see that we basically constantly, in all cases, outperform with the proposed approach, the other approaches. We also tested it for different simulated data uh, augmentation met methods. So we augmented the data to ensure that it's not the augmentation process itself, but it's the combination of augmenting using the information from the site study. And even then, we were able to actually improve the classification process. With this, let me come to a conclusion of our talk. So yes, answering the question if it's necessary to control for confounding effect, I definitely would say yes, it's necessary. If you ever stumble over a very interesting radiomic study that's not controlling for the confounding effects, really take the results with a salt of grain. We also found that a common approach that's used in literature, the feature filtering approach is suitable to control even if it's if there are some cases um, which might produce an outlier. We then found, and that's really interesting, um, that merging the information has the potential to really improve the performance we see on the, um, on the method side here. And I think that uh, we proposed a nice method here, but there's still room for improvement. And I'm looking forward to see more research in this area, both on the methodological side, but also on the data side by studies that actually produce and help to estimate a confounding effect on different data. With this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer your questions now. Thank you.